transpiration, and photosynthesis. We all know that plants require a constant supply of energy to grow, and this energy comes from light. In nature, plants receive light from the sun. Example, in a classroom, you may need to add artificial light so your plants have an adequate amount of light to grow. There are various types of artificial lights that provides uh, differing light spectrums. Uh, and before learning about these artificial lights, it is very important to understand how plants use uh, the light in the growth process. Transpiration and photosynthesis are the two major processes that are carried out by green plants which is used or that is used energy from the sun. So both of these processes uh, use large amounts of uh, light energy but only in photosynthesis is a significant amount of energy from light actually stored for future use. Light influences other processes such as flowering, seed germination, uh, certain growth stages, and pigment production. But in these cases, only very small amounts of energy from lights are used. What is transpiration? We just studied that the transportation of food in plants occurs in phloem and its water occurs in xylem. Now, we will discuss transpiration and the factors affecting it. Plants continuously absorb water from the soil, but not all the water absorbed is used by the plant. Excess water evaporates from aerial parts of plants and mostly through the stomata below the lamina of the leaf. This process is called transpiration. Ever wondered how plants draw water up against the force of gravity? The evaporation of water from leaves results in a suction force which pulls water up the xylem vessels. This suction force is called transpiration pull. It is the main force that pulls water and mineral salts up the plant. This upward movement of substances is called the transpiration stream. Factors affecting the rate of transpiration. Transpiration depends on evaporation. Therefore, Factors affecting the rate of evaporation also affect the rate of transpiration. These factors affecting the rate of transpiration are humidity, temperature, strong wind and light. Humidity of air. The intercellular spaces in the leaf are normally saturated with water vapor. If the outside air is dry, water vapor will diffuse more rapidly out of the leaf. That is, the rate of transpiration will increase. Whereas, if the air is damp or humid, evaporation is limited. The more humid the air is, the slower is the rate of transpiration. Temperature of the air. Assuming all other factors remain constant, a rise in temperature of the surroundings will increase the rate of evaporation and thus transpiration rate also increases. Strong wind. When the air is still, transpiration makes the air around the leaves moist. The water vapors build up and increase the air humidity. Hence, as we've stated before, reducing the transpiration rate. During a windy day, the moist air around the leaf is blown away, making the air less humid. This increases the rate of transpiration. The stronger wind, the higher the rate of transpiration. However, if the wind is very strong, the stomata may close because the guard cells lose too much water. What would happen if there's a cool, wet wind? Light. Light affects the size of the stomatal opening on the leaf, thus affecting the rate of transpiration. During the night or in the shade, the stomata close and reduce the rate of transpiration. But on a sunny day, the stomata open wide and increase the rate. The movement of water vapor outward also removes heat from the plants, thereby cooling the leaves and preventing them from being scorched by the hot sun. Again, the meaning of transpiration it is defined as the physiological loss of water in the form of water vapor, mainly from the stomata in leaves, but also through evaporation from the surfaces of leaves, flowers, and stems. To summarize the uh, 
uh, video which is all about transpiration, remember that during the transpiration process, plants draw in carbon dioxide from the air through their pores and water from their roots and give off oxygen and water vapor. Energy from the sun evaporates water from the plant cell walls, although this results in a movement of water in the plant tissue, which is called xylem. So this energy is uh, neither stored nor used to bring about vital reactions involved in the synthesis of foods in assimilation, growth, or reproduction. What is photosynthesis and why is it important? This is the process of making glucose, which is the energy source for most cell. It makes this from sunlight energy, water and carbon dioxide. Only plant cells can do this. The special organelle within the plant cells responsible for this process is called chloroplast. Photosynthesis goes through two stages. Stage 1. Light-dependent reaction. This reaction depends on the presence of light. It starts when photons from sunlight strike the leaf, enter all the way through to the chloroplast and its thylakoid discs, excite the chlorophyll and activate electrons. During this process, water is split into oxygen and hydrogen ions, releasing electrons. This is how the electron in the chlorophyll gets replenished and where the oxygen generated during photosynthesis comes from. The activated electrons then move through a series of electron carriers, also referred to as electron transport chain, and in this process leads to the accumulation of the hydrogen ions generating a proton gradient inside the thylakoid compartment. As the protons decrease their concentration gradient through the ATP synthase, ADP and PI come together to form ATP. The adenosine triphosphate, or the ATP, is an energy molecule that cells exchange, like currency, to release energy. The electrons going through the electron transport chain eventually end up combining with NADP+, to form NADPH, another energy-rich molecule that will be used later. Thus, the result of the light reaction is the production of oxygen released from the leaves. ATP and NADPH. The main difference between ATP and NADPH is the amount of energy molecules they release. Stage 2. Light independent or dark reaction. This reaction can proceed in the absence of light, but calling it a dark reaction might be misleading as it doesn't happen only in the dark. It can just as well happen in the light. This process uses the energy from light reaction to convert carbon dioxide into glucose. This might sound simple, but in fact, the conversion of carbon dioxide to glucose proceeds through a series of reactions that start with 3-ribulose bisphosphate, RUBP, and eventually end up with the same molecule, producing glucose in the process. Because these series of reactions start and end with the same molecule, they are referred to as a cycle. Specifically, the Calvin cycle. The overall complete photosynthesis reaction will be needing six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules powered by the sun energy to eventually produce glucose and six oxygen molecules. As long as a plant remains green, it can benefit our environment in many ways and also transfers the energy to us when we eat it. So... To summarize that, uh, photosynthesis is a process used by plants and other organisms to convert light energy into chemical energy that through cellular respiration can later be released to fuel the organism's activities. And remember that in photosynthesis, uh, which is um, literally means uh, putting together which is synthesis by means of light, which is photo. So the water is drawn up through the stem from the roots and into the leaf tissue where chloroplasts, uh, which is containing uh, the chlorophyll or what we call the green pigment, 
which can be found. So there, the water encounters carbon dioxide, which enter the leaf from the air through minute breathing pores, which is what we call the stomata, uh, that is located abundantly on the underside of the leaves. So the stomata also permits the outflow of water V4 and the oxygen. So the light, the carbon dioxide, and the water produce carbon carbohydrates which are stored in the plant and later released as energy for other vital plant functions. So um, this energy stored as chemical energy in foods um, which is carbon carbohydrates, fats, proteins, so is continually released in living cells um, during the process of what we call respiration. So basically, uh, photosynthesis stores energy and respiration releases it, enabling cells to perform the work of living by um, releasing energy Respiration provides the energy needed for all other plant functions. So all animals ultimately depend on photosynthesis because it is the method by which all basic food is created. C, P, R. Okay? Now let's get started. C, capture. A common myth is that plants only capture or absorb red and blue light. The rest of the colors, like green, go unused. Where did this myth come from? Well, in the 1970s, scientists used chemicals to extract the chlorophyll of a plant. They put it into a test tube and then measured the colors that it absorbed. Here is a graph that shows the wavelength of light that chlorophyll absorbs. On the left, there's a peak in the blues, and on the right, there's another peak in the reds. This shows that chlorophyll absorbs a lot of red and blue light. However, in the middle, in the green and yellow range, the rate is significantly lower. So chlorophyll doesn't directly absorb much green and yellow light. I actually was so interested in this that I did it in my own basement. I used spinach, a juicer, and a spectrometer. And actually, the chart I just showed you is the result of my very own experiment. So based upon the results of this experiment, you can see where people got the idea that plants only used red and blue light. Here's a purple grow light. It only puts out red and blue light, as you can see on the spectrometer reading. It exactly matches the chlorophyll absorbance chart, which looks really good on paper, like it's the perfect spectrum of grow light. But in the real world, growers didn't get the best results. The reality is Mother Nature doesn't leave anything to waste. Plants need a full spectrum of light in order to perform their best. Let's dive into exactly why. Dr. Arnon first set out to prove that the entire photosynthetic process occurs in the chloroplast. Whole cells were not used in his experiments. Now the key thing to remember is that with this chlorophyll experiment, the plant was liquefied. It was not in its natural state. In the real world, of course, the plant has structure and it acts as a whole unit. Here's our absorbance chart again. This is the chlorophyll extract. Now, compare that to what a whole leaf absorbs. You can see when the structure is intact, the leaf absorbs a lot more green and yellow light. Now let's get away from charts and see this in real life. This is a side view of a leaf. You can see that red and blue light barely penetrates the top. However, green light illuminates the entire leaf. Chlorophyll, since it absorbs the red and blue light so well, it actually blocks that light from penetrating deeper into the leaf and to any of the plant below. So when we talk about light, it's not just absorbance that is important. Green, yellow, and infrared light have high transmittance. So these are the colors that power growth beneath the canopy. Now, what do they do after they capture this light? 
That brings us to P, photosynthesis. This is the McCree par graph. It doesn't show absorbance. Instead, it shows the rate of photosynthesis by color. As you can see, when we measure photosynthesis, plants use the full spectrum of light from 400 to 700 nanometers. The term PAR is short for photosynthetically active radiation and has become synonymous with the concept that plants only use blue to red light for growth. After the disappointment of red and blue LEDs, growers turn to white LEDs. Here's a typical white LED spectrum. White LEDs were not designed for plants. They were made for us humans to see. This is why there's an emphasis on green and yellow light because those are the colors our eyes pick up the best. In addition, their range is limited to 400 to 700 nanometers. So in terms of covering the PAR range, this is an excellent light. However, it turns out that colors outside this range play an important role in photosynthesis. When Dr. McCree did this study, he limited his variables like a good scientist should. What he did is he set his experiment up to test each color individually. To do this, he took a single leaf, put it into a test chamber, and exposed it to one color at a time at low intensity. Then he measured the rate of photosynthesis. He repeated this for each color. The PAR graph can be misleading because it shows all of these individual results at the same time. Of course, in the real world, plants are exposed to all colors of light at once. So what about infrared light? If we look at this graph, it almost looks like infrared light is unused. But remember, this graph is only counting one color at a time. This is where Dr. Emerson comes into play. Dr. Emerson tested what happens when light was given to a plant two wavelengths at a time, one in the red range and one in the infrared range. And what he found was that these two wavelengths together increased photosynthesis. This extra boost of photosynthesis is called the Emerson effect. It works when any color of light in the PAR range is combined with infrared. The Emerson effect is the product of photosystem one and photosystem two in the plant. Photosystem 1 and Photosystem 2 work together and share light to boost photosynthesis. This chart shows how Photosystem 2 and Photosystem 1 interact. First, Photosystem 2 absorbs light below 680 nanometers, which is red light. It uses that light to split an electron from water and send it to Photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 then takes that electron and uses light above 700 nanometers, which is infrared light, to increase photosynthesis. Here goes. An analogy I like to use is to think about Photosystem 1 and Photosystem 2 like a high-powered V8 muscle car. Photosystem 2 is like the engine. If you don't turn the engine on, you don't give the car red light, it isn't going to run. Photosystem 1 is like the supercharger. Turning on by itself doesn't do much, but with the engine turned on, it boosts power. It takes power and weight and real acceleration to pull over the top. Now we've covered photosynthesis, and it's time to move on to R, react. How plants react to light in their environment. It's easy to forget that in nature, Plants are growing in all different light environments, and they're going to change the way they grow to get optimum growth for themselves. A great example of how plants react to light is the amount of blue in the spectrum. Blue light is what plants use to sense whether they're in the shade. And this makes sense because blue light doesn't penetrate through the plant canopy. So, if a plant is not receiving enough blue light, it's going to grow really stretchy searching for it. On the other hand, if a plant receives too much blue light, it's going to grow stunted. So there's actually an optimal amount of blue light in the spectrum 
for plants to grow their best. Here's how a plant reacts to a red and blue grow light. Because there's a limited amount of green and infrared light that penetrate deep into the plant, growth and development beneath the canopy may be limited. Also, the red and blue saturation at the tops of leaves can lead to light burn or bleaching. Additionally, in some red and blue grow lights, the amount of blue is so high that it can lead to diminished growth. Here's a typical white LED spectrum, which does a great job covering the PAR range and addresses a lot of the issues of red and blue grow lights. However, what's critical about this spectrum is the lack of infrared light. Infrared light is not only important for photosystems one and two, it also drives a host of other reactions in the plant. During vegetative growth, plants react to infrared light by growing larger. This includes bigger leaves to capture more light and stronger branching, especially beneath the canopy. Infrared also increases the amount of bud and flower sites on the plant and encourages the onset of flowering. Lastly, research indicates that infrared light increases certain antioxidants in the plant that increase aroma and flavor. Now let's take a look at a different type of light called a wideband light. It looks like a white light, but it actually isn't because it's creating colors that our eye can't see in the red and infrared range. This wideband spectrum is designed for optimal plant growth. It has plenty of green, yellow, and infrared light for excellent canopy penetration. The amount of blue light is balanced to prevent either stretching or burning. Lastly, it has an abundance of red and infrared light to drive growth from seed all the way through flower. So again, um... In light spectrums, white light, as it comes from the sun, is composed of waves of red light through successively shorter waves to violet light. light. So the band of colors that compose the visible spectrum of light, uh, which uh, we can see, uh, it includes um, starting with the longest rays, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The visible spectrum represents only a part of the radiant energy that comes from the sun, and only a part of the visible spectrum is effective in photosynthesis. The wavelength exists that we our and uh, unable to perceive with our eyes beyond the red rays are still longer rays called infrared and beyond the violet rays are even shorter rays called the ultraviolet so the fact that chlorophyll is green to the eye is evidence that some of the blue and red wavelengths of the white light are absorbed leaving proportionally more green to be transmitted reflected and seen so much of the red, blue, indigo, and violet wavelengths are absorbed and used in photosynthesis, while part of the red and most of the yellow, orange, and green are barely used in photosynthesis. So we have here uh, signs of light deficiencies. Number one, plants will stretch and reach towards the light source. Two, stem elongation three, plant deformities, and four, no fruit set. Artificial lighting, uh, if your hydrophonic garden is in direct sunlight, um, the plants should receive adequate amounts of light and absorb the spectrums they need. So in a greenhouse setting, uh, the supplemental light is sometimes used to extend the hours of light a plant receives during low light conditions. So if it is cloudy weather or short days, uh, and to extend the growing season of a plant, if you are growing in an area with some but limited sunlight, such as a wind, uh, window seal, supplemental lighting will be needed. 
So any supplemental light is beneficial to increase plant growth and production. So remember that the higher the intensity and the broader the spectrum, the greater the benefit. So you can grow um, in a completely enclosed space with no natural light if you provide all the artificial lights uh, needed. But there are several drawbacks, including the costs of the lights and the energy to run them is very high. So there may be a compromise of the plant's needs if the artificial lighting um, does not provide the complete light spectrum. So the plant needs and artificial lighting will not exactly duplicate the spectrum of light the sun provides. In this table, it shows the different wavelength light spectrum. So whether it is visible to human eye, used in photosynthesis, or used in flowering. So infrared, again, is the longest rays. None. So the red is visible to the eye or to the human eye, used in photosynthesis and used in flowering. Orange, yellow, and green is visible to human eye and used in flowering. Blue, indigo, and violet is visible to human eye and used in photosynthesis. Ultraviolet is the shortest uh, rays, none. Incandescent light. So, um, Although some supplemental light is better than none, um, incandescent light offers the lowest level of intensity and is generally better used as room light than a plant light. So specialty in incandescent grow bulbs are available and will provide a better light spectrum than a standard incandescent bulb, but the intensity is still limited. Standard incandescent bulbs are high in the red spectrum but low in the blue spectrum which most plants need for vegetative growth. So incandescent bulbs are inexpensive to initially but um, they are generally not efficient or effective for plant growth. Next we have fluorescent light. So fluorescent tubes offer a broader color spectrum and are available in a variety of kinds including bright white, cool white, warm white. So um, the plant bulbs, the light and full spectrum, which is the combination of warm and cool white, offer a broad light spectrum. So fluorescent bulbs are relatively inexpensive, long lasting, and it provides even cool lighting. The downside to fluorescent lights is that they are low in intensity and need to be close or to be very close to the plants to be effective. Seedlings, cuttings, and most uh, house plants will benefit from fluorescent lighting. Another light is what we call the metal halide light. So metal halide lights offer a um, broad spectrum with ample blue light for vegetative growth. The metal halides are most efficient than mercury vapor lights, which at one time were the primary source of HID light. So metal halides are one of the best light sources for plant growth. And if you were using only one type of light, metal halide would be the best choice. Last uh, types of light is what we call the high pressure sodium light. So this light are very efficient. Uh, they are long lasting and strong in a yellow red spectrums. Their only disadvantage is that they are they aren't quite strong enough in the blue spectrum, which is for um, vegetative development. So the high pressure sodium lights are a good choice for flowering plants. 
because the combination of the or the combination of the metal halide and the high pressure sodium offers the broadest light spectrum and must be used in the situations where um, no natural light is found.